All right, so as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the worship service. Thank you for your people. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for our pastors. Thank you for our members. Thank you for those who know the Lord as their personal Savior. Lord, we're asking that those who do not know you yet, as Savior, as Lord, today you reveal yourself to everyone and get us to the right side of the cross in Jesus' name. And for those who are saved, we pray, Lord, that indispensable experience of sanctification and holiness, you help us to thirst for it, hunger for it, be passionate for it, and be sanctified and made holy in the Lord in Jesus' name. And feel the sanctified with the power of the Holy Ghost. We pray that you reveal your truth to us today and strengthen us for the life you want us to live here on earth. So that on the final day, we'll be with you up in glory in heaven in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. We're coming to 1 Samuel chapter 30. As we look at 1 Samuel chapter 30, we want to uh, tell those who might be worshipping with us for the first time. We studied this during the period of uh, searching the scriptures together. So the scripture period is what other churches call Sunday school. A school for the believers to learn the word of God. It's Sunday school, but we call it here, searching the scriptures. The Lord Jesus said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. And whenever we study the scriptures like that, if there are areas in the chapter that we want to understand more, we go back to that. Just to serve you notice and for you to understand what we're doing, what we're doing. In this chapter, we learned about David's victory. And now we're talking about the believer's victory. Many of the things we're talking about today, that we're talking about, many of us already know. If we already know them, why are we emphasizing them? Once again, we're looking at Second Peter chapter 1. In Second Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. Second Peter chapter 1 verse 12. It says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Whenever we bring the word of God on any area, any subject, and any perspective, it's not because uh, the pastor thinks we're ignorant. No, not at all. Peter the apostle said, I know you know these things. And you're even establishing the present truth. All the same, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance. Not only that, there are times when your neighbors will ask you, why do you stand for this? Why do you believe this? After all, look at this, look at this, and look at that. And then you are able to tell them in 1 Peter chapter 3, reading from verse 15. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you of or asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. There are times your stand might be challenged. Your doctrine might be challenged. And your certainty of scripture or the practice of your life might be challenged. And then you are able to give an answer to what they are asking. Are you able to reestablish? This is why you believe what you believe. Now coming back to first Samuel. Chapter 30, and I'm reading from verse 18. And David recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away. We understand that. He had prayed because 
what he had, his property, and then the people that belonged to him that had been carried away. And then they wept, they were in distress, and they wanted restoration. And now the Bible tells us, as the Lord had promised him, and as uh, the Lord had told him to pursue, and that he will recover all, actually he pursued. And we're told that David recovered all. We're looking at verse 19. And there was nothing lacking to them. Neither small nor great. Neither sons nor daughters. Neither spoil nor anything. That they are taking to, uh, to them. David, tell me the rest. Recovered all. So far, so good. And that's what we want as believers. That whatever we have lost, we recover. But then the question is, what is it you have lost? If you think about your Christian life, you might find that you have lost some important things. You might have lost your faith in the Lord, your first love, you might have lost. Your first consecration, you might have lost. And the first blessings you urge, your salvation, and your earnestness in the Lord, or your holiness, and your devotion to the word of the Lord, you might have lost, and you want to recover everything. We're not just thinking about material things to recover, we want to recover all the spiritual things that we have lost. That's all right, but now look at the latter part of verse 18. And David rescued, tell me out loud, I can't hear you, verse 18. And David rescued, tell me out loud, his two wives. That's the problem. And there are times when people will ask us, there have been good men in the Bible, righteous men in the Bible, respected men in the Old Testament, favored men in the Old Testament. They had two, they had three, they had four, they had whatever, many wives. And why do you say what you say? Why do you stand where you stand? Before I go on, Judges chapter 8. We're looking at Judges chapter 8. And here in Judges chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 13. And Gideon had three score and ten sons, that's seventy sons, of his body begotten. For he had many wives. Gideon, a respected uh, champion, of the Old Testament, he had many wives. We're looking at uh, First Kings chapter 11. Uh, this one surpasses them all. We're looking at First Kings chapter 11, and I'm reading from verse 3. And he had 700 wives, this is Solomon, and princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wife turned away his heart. We have learned about uh, some of the Old Testament people. They had victory over the Amalekites. They had victory over the Philistines. They had victory over their physical enemies. They didn't have victory over the flesh. They didn't have victory over their lost. They didn't have victory over the practices of the heathen around them. And that's an important victory. Having victory over the Amalekites, you could have that and miss heaven. Having victory over the Philistines, you could have that and still not be in relationship, good fellowship with the Lord. You could have victory over the physical enemies and yet you might not have that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. What's the victory we're talking about? Victory over the world. Victory over the flesh and victory over the devil. Believers are called to engage in warfare against the devil, against the world, and against the flesh. Our battle today is not against the Amalekites, but against the abominations of the Amalekites. Against, not against people, but against the perversions of the people, against the pollutions and the practices of the old time people and the present day seen as small or great, lowly or high, royal or tribal. That's what we're talking about today, the, uh, the believer's victory over gentle abominations. That's the topic today, believer's victory. Believers in the plural, believer's victory over gentle abominations. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 
First Corinthians chapter 15. And here we're reading from verse 57. It tells us in verse 57, it says, Thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament tells us that sinners are dead in trespasses and sins. Dead people cannot have victory. The Bible tells us that sinners are weak. They are carnal. The things they want to do, they cannot do. And sinners who are weak in themselves, they cannot have the victory over the devil, over the world, over sin, over the flesh. But here he's talking about those who are born again, those who are children of God, those who have salvation. Because except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And he says, thanks be to God. He giveth us born again people. He giveth us redeemed, saved people. He giveth us the people that have their names in the book of life. He giveth us the victory. Victory over the devil. He giveth us the victory. Victory over the world. He giveth us the victory. Victory over the flesh through our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, reading from verse 3. The victory he grants to the people that know him. The people who are washed in the blood of the Lamb. He tells us in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. We, those who are born again. We, those who delight in the Lord, we, those who have known the Lord, they have visited Calvary, they are on their way to the promised land, to heaven. It says, we keep his commandments, and those commandments are not grievous. It says, for whatsoever, that means whosoever, for whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, tell me, even our faith. The faith you had in Jesus that granted you salvation. That faith that sets you free from sin also makes you to have the victory over the world. Who is see that overcomes the world? You see the church, I'm talking about the church at large. I'm talking about the Pentecostal church. I'm talking about the evangelical church. I'm talking about the present day church. The church at large. They're not thinking about victory over the world. Worldliness is, you know, rife and terrible and deep in many places. But, you know, if you're talking about victory, the kind of victory we ought to have, believers are not talking about that today. Church goers are not talking about that today. They go to conventions and camps and they are praying and fasting. They want to have the victory. Victory over the enemy. Victory over their neighbors. Victory over their co-workers. And victory over the villagers. And victory over this and over that. But the real victory, the New Testament is talking about for the children of God. It says, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. There are people who will fast 7 days, 14 days, 21 days, 40 days, and uh, some even go beyond 40 days. What are they fasting about? They want to have the victory. Victory over recession, and victory over poverty, and victory over enemies. And they never think for one day, we need the victory over the flesh. They never fast about that. We need the we need victory over peculiar, habitual, besetting sins. They never think about that, but the victory over this and that. But the Lord is calling us a sin. Let's come back to the Bible. We need victory over gentle abominations. It tells us in 2 Peter chapter 2, reading from verse 19, 2 Peter Chapter 2, verse 19. While they promised them liberty, they promised them freedom. They themselves are the servants of corruption. The servants of corruption. You know, corruption in various ways. In politics, corruption. In churches, corruption. Men and women, corruption. In society, corruption. And this is what we need to have the victory over. That your life will be so different that people will know you have got the victory. And there are people that promise themselves, uh, uh, they're themselves uh, servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome. Of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped 
the pollutions of the world through, uh, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein. How many people have been saved and born again? And you overcame all these pollutions of the world before, but now they are again overcome, again overcome by those pollutions. And the Bible says when that happens and they again overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. And that's the reason why we are looking at the scriptures on the believer's victory over the abominations of the Gentiles, over gentle abominations. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. In Revelation chapter 3 verse 5, he that overcometh, I will overcome. He that overcometh, I will overcome. You know, there are people that can, you know, they, they pray and they fast and, and they say, all those Amalekites overcame them. We're talking about another kind of coming that gets you to heaven. All some people will say, all those Egyptians, I routed them. I sent them away and they cannot stand before me. And you know, when I stand, all those enemies, whatever they have, evil spirit, evil power, they know because I confront them and I fight them and I will not give them an inch in my life or in my family. That's good. That, that's good. But we're talking about something else now. The thing that will make you an overcomer that the Lord himself will appreciate. In verse 5, he that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What a real perversion, because there is perversion in the world, pollution in the world that we need to overcome, and you are going to overcome. On area of perversion that is prevalent today is marriage and the family. There's perversion, so much perversion about marriage, and so much perversion about the family. And as the coming of Christ draws near, the perversion of marriage and the pollution of the family will be common. We must watch, we must take heed, we must remain victorious and be ready. I pray you'll be ready. I said you'll be ready. The believer's victory over gentle abominations. There are three things we're going to look at. Number one, the abominations and perversions of great men. Great men, royal men, political men, highly placed people, rich people. The, the, the abominations and the perversions of great men. Oh, we're talking about that because great men are influential. Great women are influential. And people of commerce, and people of trade, and people of politics, and people of power, they're very, very influential. And people will say, if so and so can do that, what stops me from doing that? And anyway, those who believe the Bible, they go through their Bible, they're searching for some people in the Bible, see what David did, see what Solomon did, see what Gideon did, and see what all these people did. If they could do that, what stops me? That's how we're looking at the abominations and the perversions of great men. Point number two, divine authority and prescription for a godly marriage. The divine authority and prescription for a godly marriage. Number three, our acknowledgement and perseverance in the God-given message. Our acknowledgement and perseverance in the God-given message. Number one, tell me there. Tell me if you're still there. The abominations and the perversions of a great man. As we talk about great men, we're talking about great women too. You know, there are people leading. They do not take their practice from the Bible, from the Word of God. Even those who say they are born again, even those who say they are Christians, once they read in the papers, do you know that uh, Pastor so and so did this and this? They begin to think and say, 
That's a respected man of God. That's a great man of God. And if that great man of God has uh, decided to do this, I want to dig into this. In these days of uh, internet and social media, you can get any information you want to get about anybody. If he has done this and see that man, he has a big church, he has a growing, uh, a growing uh, followership, and he's doing that. If he has done that, then if they're having problems in their marriages, if they're having problems staying with their wife, then they say, well, I think uh, if that man is justified, and you know, God is still answering his prayers. He prays for people. Miracles are happening. And then if you read some of his materials, the, the, the depths of wisdom in his materials, you, you, you find this and that. And because of that, they go astray because of those abominations of great men and great women. Job chapter 32. I'm reading from verse 9. Job Chapter 32, verse 9. Very important. Please open your Bible. Job chapter 32, verse 9. Tell me the first two words there. I said, tell me the first two words there. You have not opened your Bible. That's why I'm checking off. Job chapter 32, verse 9. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for you. Uh, tell me those uh, first two words. Great men. Great men are not always wise. So you don't follow them. Follow the scriptures. Great men are not always wise. Great women are not always wise. Neither do the aged understand judgment. You cannot build your life on the lives of great men, great women. You cannot build your doctrine on the lives of great men and great women. You cannot build your life on the life of David, on the life of Solomon, on the life of those uh, people. The word of God is very clear. He has given us his own word. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5, and I'm reading from verse 4. Jeremiah chapter 5, we're reading from verse 4. It tells us in verse 4, Therefore I said, surely these are poor. They are foolish, they are for they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. Look at this now. I will get me unto great men. He saw some other people. These are ordinary people. This one will not understand. He saw some people. He said that these one are the common people of the land. They will not understand. Let me get to the great men. Look at verse 5. I will get me unto the great men, great women too, and will speak unto them. For they have known the way of the Lord and the judgment of their God. But he found something different. But these have all together broken the yoke and burst the bounds. Therefore, a lion out of the forest shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over their cities. Every man that goeth out thence shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many. Great men. Their transgressions are many, great women, and their backslidings are increased. That's the reason why, uh, you understand, there are abominations of the great men and the great women too. We're looking at the first Kings chapter 11. First Kings chapter 11. The word of God has been made very clear to the kings of Israel. But then we look at, uh, this is a wise man. First Kings chapter 11, in verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Look at the record of the Bible. The wise man, the great man, the rich man, the royal man, the one that is, was highly placed among the children of Israel. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh. Think about that. The relationship between Israel and Egypt. And how God brought them out of Egypt and said, you never go that direction. And you never go back to Egypt. And now he married the daughter of Pharaoh. Women of the Moabites, think about that. A Moabites will not come into the congregation of the children of Israel, of the Ammonites, of the Edomites belonging to Esau, of the Sidonians, of the Hittites. 
This is Solomon, great man, and of the nations concerning which the Lord had said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in to them. The Lord had said, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in to you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their God. Solomon claimed unto these in love. Solomon, great man. And then when you look at the lives of such people and the influence they exert on society, it's like, hey, look at so-and-so, he's doing that. It's not so-and-so, look at the watch of God. You're not going to be judged on the final day on the basis of what a great man, a great woman has done. You're going to be judged on the basis of the watch of God. That uh, great man might be your relative. That great woman might be your relative. Doesn't matter. The word of God is still greater. Whatever they have done against the word of God, I ever much will respect them in other areas. Those are still abominations and deviations from the word of God. Verse 3. And he had 700 wives and princesses and 300 concubines and his wives turned away his heart for it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wife turned away his heart after all the gods and his heart was not perfect of the Lord his God as was the heart of David his father for Solomon went after Ashtoreth the goddess, the idol of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abominations of the Ammonites, and Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as this David his father. Then did Solomon build what? And I place for Chimosh, for Chimosh. He began now. He had built the temple of the Lord. Now he's going to build temple for this and for this and for this. Actually, the temples he built for idols, they were more in number than what he built for God. Because if you look at verse 7, then Solomon built, uh, then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab in the hill that is before Jerusalem and uh, for Molech the abomination of the children of Ammon look at verse 8 and likewise did he likewise did he for tell me all his strange wise if his full time work became uh, building a temple here uh, I also have my own temple I'm your wife okay I'll build for you built another one like that and wasted the resources where did he get the money that's the money that God gave him the one that God said I'll make you richer than every other person on earth he lavished all that in building temples of idols and likewise did he for all his strange wives which burnt incense and sacrifice unto all the gods so what's the result what's the consequence look at the person some people want to uh, copy and they will say that you know solomon was a man favored by god and solomon was a great a royal personality and because he was a royal personality look at what he did and therefore they want to multiply wives in verse 9 and the, the lord was tell me angry with solomon god is no respecter of persons he was angry with solomon and if anybody does that today, and if you see you, you abandon the word of God, you abandon the doctrines of Christ, and then you run after so and so has done it, so and so has done it, and because so and so has done it, I too, I want to do it, God will be angry with you. I'm, you know, copying Madam so and so, I'm copying Mommy so and so, I'm copying Daddy so and so, I'm copying Reverend so and so, I'm copying Bishop so and so. God will be angry with you. He exalts his word above his name. He puts his word as central. Central to your Christian life and central to your faith. He has not raised up a man or raised up a woman and said, okay, abandon my word. Look here for my word and follow that man. If you follow after Solomon or any other person like Solomon, the judgment of God will be upon you. I pray that we will not follow bad example in Jesus' name. And the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared 
unto him twice and had commanded him the Lord had commanded him uh, concerning this sin that he would not go after other gods but he kept not that which the Lord commanded wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend out here, I'll take away the kingdom from thee, and will give it to thy servants. So the Lord is warning us that we will not follow after the abominations of these people. And look at what the Lord had commanded. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7. And I'm reading from verse 3. Deuteronomy chapter 7. We're looking at verse 3. In verse 3 it tells us, Neither shall thou make marriages with them. The word of God is very clear. If you are an Israelite, you will not make marriages with the Gentiles, with the Canaanites, with all those nations that the Lord are driven out before you. And if you are a child of God, be not unequally yoked together with some believers. Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto a son. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto a son. What's that saying? It's saying that you are the father, you are the mother, you have the authority over your children. And the when those unbelievers come, you know that this one, this boy is an unbeliever, this boy is not born again, this boy is still living in darkness. And then your son, your daughter is saying, I met him at the university, I met him in college, and that's the one I'm going to marry. Because, are you not a believer? Yes, I'm a believer, but I love him. It says you'll not give your consent. The child might uh, put pressure. The child might, you know, become rebellious and throw a tantrum. It says you will not do it. It says neither shall thou make marriages with them. Thy daughter thou shalt not give unto a son. And his daughter thou shalt not take unto thy son. And they cannot do that marriage except you give your consent. Except you take that daughter from the Gentile world. You take that daughter from the Gentile denomination. The people that say they are churches and they are not standing on what it means to be born again. And then your daughter comes and your son comes. It says you will not. What does it say? But for for they will turn away thy son from following me. Your son will say, oh, Mommy, Daddy, you've taught me the word of God. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. Nobody can change my mind. In fact, I'm going to bring her to believe everything I believe. That's what they say. Sodom was not able to do it. Neither will you be able to do it. They were, it's easy for, you know, if you're on top and then somebody is at the bottom and then you have a rope connecting you and then you're pulling. You want to pull her up and she wants to pull you down. Which one is easier, to pull up or to pull down? To pull down. That's why it says, for they will turn away thy son from following me and that they may serve other gods. So will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. I pray that you will, will escape this sudden destruction in Jesus' name. Verse 6, For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. That was the word of God to all the children of Israel. And uh, if uh, Solomon had, you know, seen that and read that and thought of that and obeyed that, he wouldn't have done what he did. A great man, a rich man, a highly placed man, but he went astray. You will not go astray. And let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 14. It says, when thou art come unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and thou shalt possess it, and shalt dwell therein, and shalt say, listen to this, I will set a king over me. I will set a king over me, like as all the nations that are about me. Thou shalt in any wise set him king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose. One from among thy brethren shall thou set king over thee. Thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. Look at this. But 
he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt. Whoever you set as king must be one among you, one that knows the doctrine, one that knows the teaching, one that knows the statutes of the Lord that I gave to the children of Israel. And he will not take the people back to Egypt. What did Solomon do? As Solomon married uh, the daughter of Pharaoh, was that? Then that's the way back to Egypt. That's like, uh, you know, uh, Egypt is not that bad after all. Egypt is not that abominable after all. And then it says, for as much as the Lord has said, ye shall henceforth return no more that way. Look at this. Neither shall he tell me multiply wives to himself that's the word of god for the kings of israel neither shall he multiply wives unto himself and so having one wife and second and third until 700 and then 700 uh, wives were not enough and then 300 concubines Oh, what's a man doing with so many women? And then it says over here, Neither shall he greatly uh, multiply to himself silver and gold, and it shall be when he seated upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is uh, before the priest, the Levites, and it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life. He read the word of God all the days days of his life that was the word and so if any of the kings of israel any of the rich people in israel any of the great people in, in israel if they went against that if they disobeyed that uh, that means they were following the way of perdition the way of perversion the way of pollution and uh, the real child of god who wants to go to heaven will not be given excuse uh, solomon married that david married that because they did that i too i can do whatever no, you are not following them. Those, those people, uh, that was the, because of the hardness of their heart, because of their rebellion, because of their disobedience. It's not that they were ignorant. They were not ignorant. They knew the word of the Lord. And they still went against that. And God told them and spoke to them directly and pointedly and pungently and said, you will not go this direction. And Solomon, in his own case, he said, the Lord appeared unto him. And the Lord told him, this is not what you do. And he still did it anyhow. You will not follow that kind of rebellious way in Jesus' name. I can't hear our people. Yeah. Malachi, Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2. I'm reading from verse, I'm reading from verse 11. Malachi chapter 2, verse 11. Judah has dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. That is, uh, God loves holiness. But then Judah, the people that are calling themselves the people of God, they polluted the, the holiness of the Lord and has married the daughter of a strange God. As Mary, the daughter of a strange God, the Lord will cut up the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, and the uh, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. And this have ye done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with crying, hypocritical crying and weeping, and then crying out in so much that he regarded not the offering anymore, nor receiveth each with goodwill at your hand. Yet she say, wherefore? Because the Lord has been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth against whom thou wast dealt treacherously. And yet she is the, thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. There were some of the children of Israel, since their kings had gone astray, they too they started, you know, marrying and divorcing their wives. And then, well, if a king can do this, if the great man can do that, if the great woman can do that, why can't I? And then the Lord was angry with them. Look at verse 15. And did he not make one? Yet had he the residue of 
the Spirit, and wherefore one, that ye might seek a godly seed, therefore take heed to your spirit, and let not deed treacherously against the wife of his youth. Who is the wife of the youth? Not the first wife. The first wife. That's what the Lord taught them. He said, that's your first wife. It's the wife of a youth. You will not deal treacherously. And then in verse 16, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hateth putting away. He hateth divorce. He hateth putting away the wife or putting away the husband. Sin, disobedience, abomination, perversion, evil does not become less sinful because it is committed by a great man. There are some people that, you know, they change their convictions on the word of God. This is what they have believed before until they begin to see the example of a respected man and the example of an honorable woman. And they said, if that honorable woman is doing this, if that respected man is doing this, they change their conviction. They cannot stand anymore. But sin does not become less sinful because it's a great man practicing it, a favored king practicing it, because it's a great figure that is practicing it, because it's a literary genius that is practicing that thing, or a national personality. And they look at that national personality and they say, if that a man high and great and rich and favored and honored, if he is doing this, look at this woman. If this woman is respected by everybody, honored by everybody, and favored by everybody, if that woman is doing this, then it must be right. Uh-uh. Sin is still sin. Whatever the Lord has commanded against is still standing where you stood. That's the reason why you understand sin is sin. Whether it's committed by David, or it's committed by Solomon, or it's committed by Gideon. Polygamy is sinful and unacceptable. Polygamy is so scriptural. Though David practiced it, and though Solomon practiced it, and though Gideon disobeyed God's word on this point, polygamy is still sinful. What's the word of God? The word of God is the final authority for all the children of God. Look at the word of God of marriage. How many wives are you supposed to marry? How many husbands are you supposed to have? Look at Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him, tell me what follows there. Plural or singular? Tell me out loud. I will make him, what's that? And help meet for him. Is that singular or plural? Singular. I'll make him and help meet. Look at verse 24. And look at he, whether it is singular or plural, wife's wife for a man. Therefore shall a man, how many? Leave his father. How many fathers? And his mother, how many mothers? And shall cleave unto his wife, plural, singular, singular, and they shall be one flesh. From the very beginning, you'll find that is the word of God. That is the word of God. And since God had commanded that, the people of Israel should have noticed that and if they didn't notice that the people who are living today children of god we will stay by the word of god in jesus name in fact when the people ask a question from the lord jesus christ he went back to the right to the beginning and uh, good you knew this before but it's good to remind ourselves in Matthew chapter 19, Matthew chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 4. Matthew chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 4. And he said, he answered and said unto them, Have you not read? Any question you have, have you not read? Anything you want to find out, solution to, have you not read? You have problem in marriage and you have, you need counseling, have you not read? And uh, there's no child in the family, what am I going to do? Have you not read? My people are now saying that, you know, they've got a better woman for me, have you not read? Any question you have in the Bible, any question you have in your marriage, you go back to the Bible, have you not read? He said that he which made them at the 
beginning. You go back to the beginning. The beginning of the Christian faith. The beginning of the church. And the beginning, what was established at that time. Rather than, you know, so and so is doing this. Such and such is doing that. And such and such is writing this or writing that. And in the social media, this word is saying, go back to the beginning. It says, he which made them, made them, tell me. Mainland. One man, and tell me the rest. One woman, and said, For this cause shall a man, singular, leave father, singular, and mother, singular, and shall cleave unto his wife, singular, and they two, not three, and they two, man, woman, shall be one flesh. Wherefore, and they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. It tells us in a look at Luke. Luke chapter 14. And here the Lord is not really discussing marriage, but you look at the consistency of the word of God. In Luke chapter 14, I'm reading from verse 25. Luke chapter 14, verse 25, it says, And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, Look at this, If any man come to me and hate not, what? His father, plural or singular, and mother, singular or plural, and wife, singular or plural, and children, that's plural, brethren, that's plural, sisters, that's plural, and his own life, that's singular, his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You see what he's telling us? He's telling us whenever we're talking of a man, woman, a marriage, one man, one wife, and this uh, polygamy that is, you know, creeping in into some uh, churches, some assemblies, you know, they just put aside one wife, she's still alive, and they get another one. And then after some months, after some years, if, uh, you know, things are not going straight, the, man, the woman is still alive, they push that aside and get another one. That's polygamy. That's polygamy. They still have the living wives, and then they marry another one. And they keep on preaching. And they keep on doing whatever. And they keep on influencing young lives. And young people are going there. Older people are going there. And they're clapping and they're supporting. And they're writing this and writing that. It's aberration. It's abomination. It's pollution. It's defilement of the word of God. By the grace of God, I'm looking at you there. You will stand. We will stand for the word of God in Jesus' name. Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 28. Ephesians chapter 5, and we're reading from verse 28. It says in verse 28, So ought men, plural, to love their wives, plural, as their own bodies, plural. Whenever you find men as plural, that is, you have four men, you're going to have four wives. And you have a three a sons of uh, sons of uh, Noah. They're going to have three wives of Noah. They're not going to have only two, you know, for the three of them. Only one for the three of them. One man, one wife, another man, another wife, another man, another wife. Three men and three and three women. So what men plural to love their wives plural as their own bodies plural. Come back to now. Second part. He that loveth the singular now. He that loveth tell me. His wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause, listen to this, listen to this, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, all singular, and shall be joined unto his wife, singular, and it twain, the two shall be one flesh. You know, it's a very clear, and uh, marriage is also a picture of Christ and the church. Look at verse 33. Verse 33, nevertheless, it says in verse 32, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife singular, even as himself, and the wife singular, see that she reverence her 
husband, singular. We're looking at Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Revelation chapter 19, and we're reading from verse 7. In Revelation chapter 19, verse 7, see what the word of God is saying concerning Christ and then concerning his bride. Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 7. In verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And uh, tell me, and his wife has made herself ready. If you are sincere with the word of God and you want to get to heaven, you want to stand on the word of God, you want to understand that this is what the word of God has said. And anybody practice anything that is different from that is abomination, is perversion. And it is of the gentle people, even though they may be great men or great women that practice that, we're still going to stand on the word of the Lord. You will stand in Jesus' name. Point number two, the divine authority and prescription for a godly marriage. Divine authority and the prescription for a godly marriage. We we'll read in Psalm 138, Psalm 138, Psalm 138, I'm reading from verse 2. In Psalm 138, verse 2, I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name, thy loving kindness, and for thy truth. Listen to this. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Have you seen that? I said, have you seen that? Thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Now look up here. The name of the Lord or the name of David, which one is greater? The name of the Lord or the name of Solomon, which one is greater? The name of the Lord or the name of a great man here on earth, here in the church, which one is greater? The name of the Lord or the name of a great woman here in the world, here in the church, which one is greater? Now, the name of the Lord is greater than any other name, any other example. And he has magnified his word above all his name. If the word is greater than the name of the Lord, and the name of the Lord is greater than the name of any man or any woman, then the word of God is greater than any man. Greater than any woman. Therefore, you'll not set the word of God aside and then run after the example of so and so. The example of such and such. Because he has magnified his word above all his name. His word is above his name. Above all names. Above David. Above Solomon. Above any other name. Any other name of a man or of a woman. That's why the word of God is so important, so essential, and it's the final authority in every decision you are taking on marriage or any other thing. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, I'm reading from verse 89, Psalm 100. And 19, verse 89, it says in verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Coming back to marriage, you know what, what God emphasized and what he ordained, what he instituted at the very beginning. And all throughout the last book of the Old Testament, in Malachi, it says, the wife of the youth, stay with her. I hate divorce. Then we come to Matthew and the words of the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, the man and the woman, the male and the female, the husband and the wife, they too shall be one flesh and it is until death do us part. And that word is established forever and it says it is forever settled in heaven. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 and we're reading from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 40 and we're reading from verse 8. In verse 8, it tells us very clearly, it says, uh, and The grass withereth, and the flower fadeth, but the word of, the, of our God shall stand. How long? Forever. 
forever. And so as you read in the word of God, this how marriage should go. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. You will not say that's in the olden days. That's at that time. But now I love her like something. I want to get her like something. And then you get into trouble. I pray you'll drop everything that is not of God in Jesus' name. And when it says the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of the God shall stand forever. How does the New Testament apply that? Look at First Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. And you'll find those same words now apply to the gospel. It tells us in First Peter chapter 1 i read him from verse 24 it says for all flesh is as grass and the glory all the glory of man as the flower of the grass it's talking about man now it says all the greatness of men the glory of men the honor of men the influence of men all those men and women he said they are just like grass and then it says that the flower that fadeth away the grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away but the word of the lord endureth forever the word of the Lord endureth forever. I said the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. It says the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which is preached unto you. The word of salvation is endures forever. The word of repentance endures forever. And the word of righteousness, except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. That word endures forever. There's the word of self-denial. You know why people divorce? There's no self-denial. And you know they can't have it their own way. The woman is not doing like I please. And she's not, uh, you know, doing this way, doing that way. And because it's not that way there's no self-denial that's why they divorce and the women it's not because they cannot bear their cross you know there's the cross that the challenge they have in that marriage there is uh, you know children delayed and this one delayed and that one delayed and then they're going back to their old man friend to their old boyfriend and they say well i said no to you before but now since it looks like you are richer than you know where i am now if you're still interested i'm interested why they cannot bear their cross they cannot have self-denial and the word of the lord concerning cross bearing and self-denial is still abiding today the word of the lord on sanctification and holiness that word abided forever the word of the lord concerning the love that we should have a marriage and the family that word endures forever uh, what's the word of the lord concerning marriage what's he telling us today we're coming back to matthew chapter 19 Matthew chapter 19, the divine authority, the word of God, what you are looking at as you are considering marriage. You see, I've not married yet, yet you need this. If you're going to marry just one wife, you better be sure that it is the will of God. Because in that marriage, challenges might come. And once you get married, you are married, you are married. And you cannot say, well... I didn't think through. I didn't pray through. I want to drop this one and marry another one. That will be adultery. We're coming to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verse 3. The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? If we're not happy with her, can we put her away? If she doesn't know how to cook, can we put her away? If she's uh, not a good homemaker, can we put her away? If she doesn't know to manage our business, can we put her away? If she doesn't respect uh, my daddy, my mommy, can we put her away? If she's not acceptable anymore to our people and she's not from our tribe, can we put her away? And if she's not, you know, she's not educated. You know, when we're going to marry, I was blindfolded by, by infatuation, by love. 
and now I can see I'm really ashamed of her grammar and when she talks I cannot stand it can I put her away can we put away the wife for every cause that's what they were asking can we find an excuse can we find a fault can we find a problem and put her away look at verse 4 and he answered and said unto them have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female and said for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they twain shall become one flesh that word cleave is like when you glue two sheets of paper together to separate them you actually destroy both of them you destroy because they're gummed together they're glued together they cleave together and it says a male and female husband and wife they are together you cannot separate them look at this some people say okay i got married when i didn't have the knowledge of the truth i got married when i was an unbeliever and now I'm a believer and the woman cannot understand the jot of what I believe and the man cannot understand anything of what I believe and the sins were no more compatible can I put her away the Pharisees were not born again the Pharisees were not following sound doctrine but they were married already and Jesus was telling them marriage is in show God for everybody in the world and once you are married whether you are a believer you are not a believer you are married you are married and it says for this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother and they shall cleave to get, uh, and they shall cleave he shall keep to his wife and it will shall be one flesh it's not talking of concubine it's not talking of you know you you didn't really get married you see Solomon he had 300 wives and then uh, 700 wives and 300 concubines why did they call some wives why did they call others concubines because for the concubines there was no marriage there was no legal scene there was nothing binding it was just come it was like you know just uh, use them uh, to fulfill its pleasure that one is no marriage that's uh, a concubine but when it is marriage the man and the woman and they are legally married and properly married and they're joined together it says they will not separate then it goes on in verse 6 wherefore they no more twain but one flesh what therefore who join them together bishop who join them together minister no registry no it is the institution of god these uh, these were pharisees and he told these pharisees God joined you together with your wife. God joined you together with your husband. And because you are joined together, what therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. I pray you obey the word of God. Somebody there said, will obey the word of God. Romans chapter 7, Romans chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. For the woman which has an husband is bound by the law. That's the law of God. To her husband, so long as he liveth. The man, the woman, who, which had an husband is bound by the law of God. To her husband, so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from that law, from the law of the husband. So then, if while her husband, not concubine, if so then, if while her husband lives, not same partner, we're talking of husband, real husband, so then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another, she shall be called, she shall be called, uh, have you come back home? I said she shall be called. Now, when an adulteress dies in that stage of adultery, she goes to heaven. If a man dies in the state of adultery, he goes to heaven. You see, you can, you can preach, you can do activity, you can do this and do that. You can, you know, get into any area of the things of the world and be respected and be highly pleased. But when we're talking about heaven, when we're talking about being with the Lord on the final day, 
this is very important. And you don't need any counseling from anybody. You know, we cannot see the GS, we cannot see the pastor, we cannot see state overseer, we cannot see a uh, region overseer uh, to counsel us about this. What have you been counseled about? What's the counseling? The counseling is the word of God. You read the word of God. You know the word of God. If the man had married another person before and they were properly married, we're not talking of concubinage. If they were really married and now you are married to that person, you married an adulteress and you don't want to die in that condition you are not waiting for you know I want to see the pastor I want to explain to him this is my situation you know the truth you are an adult when you reached out for her you didn't come to pastor you didn't come back to G, come to GS and when you reached out to him you didn't come to anybody if you knew enough to make the negotiation and to make the interaction and to make the connection and to make the relationship without seeing somebody if you don't see that this is wrong you are the person that invited her, you are the person that got into him, then you should be able to know that this is what I'm going to do. I pray you will get to heaven. I said you will get to heaven. Brothers and sisters, look up here, you know, if you are living in the wrong place, you are living in adultery, and the Bible says you are an adulteress, and then you are running up and down, I'm doing evangelism, I'm distributing trials, I'm going to revival, I'm going to convention, I'm going to camp, but you're still living in adultery, and you're fasting, and you're praying, you're living in adultery, and then you believe all the doctrine, you join choir, you join workers, and then I'm doing this, you are very active. All that will not do. All that will not do. Because if you die in that condition, anybody can perform the burial ceremony. If you die in that condition, you'll go to hell. That's the reason you're not waiting for anything you say. This is the word of the Lord. I'm going to obey the word of the Lord. Look at verse 3. So then, if while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead... If her husband be dead, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Once the wife is dead, then you are free to marry. Once the husband is dead, then you are free to marry. Whatever people did in the past, whatever people are still doing today, God's original institution still stands. I said God's word still stands. Problems may come. Traditions may come. They do not change God. They do not change Christ's word. And they do not change his church. They will not change the word of God. They will not change you in Jesus' name. You know, there are people, they want to uh, give uh, some uh, excuse. And they want to have the liberty to do whatever they want to do. Sometimes you'll find uh, somebody is, um, you know, he has all the liberty, you know, in the church uh, to be an overseer, to be a pastor, to be a preacher. And then he comes to you and he says he wants to go. You say, oh, what's the problem? Uh, God has given me a ministry. What kind of ministry? You have the liberty. There are millions in the place where you are ministering. You can preach to them. You can uh, make uh, programs and have crusades and have everything you want to have. And uh, so why, why do you have to leave to go and uh, start another thing from the scratch? Uh, they say, well, um, I just believe that God wants me to leave. And, and the, the real problem is they want to change the word of God. They want to adulterate the word of God. Uh, they want to cut corners. They want to make excuses. Uh, they say, well, um, I'm not enjoying my wife. I'm not enjoying my family. And as long as I'm here, I know that this is what is required. Because, uh, you know, we read everything. We don't make any allowance at all. And they think that if they leave, they'll be able to make some allowance you know, that allowance they make uh, without cross-bearing, self-denial, keeping to the word of God, I pity them, and you should pity them, it will land them in hellfire. Look at this, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18. For I testify unto every man, I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life 
and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. You know, if you say you go out to have another ministry, uh, have another preaching, I don't accept everything just like that. I'm going to modify my own and my preaching. You endanger your soul. And what shall it profit a man? If he gain the whole world and then he loses his own soul, what shall man give in exchange for his soul? We're looking at Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. And I'm reading from verse 5. Every word of God is pure. Somebody give me a good amen. amen. Every word of God or repentance, that's pure. Every word of God on restitution, that's pure. Every word of God on redemption, righteousness, that's pure. Every word of God on cross, bearing your cross and denying yourself. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God on sanctify them through thy truth. Thy watch is truth. Every word of God on, and those that thirst after righteousness shall be filled. Every word of God that says, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Lord. Every word of God that says, except uh, there is righteousness, is greater than that of the Pharisees, he shall not get to the kingdom of God. Every word of God that says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God that says, So shall man leave his uh, father and mother and be joined unto his wife, and they two shall become one flesh. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Arch not thou unto his words. Arch not thou unto his word, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. If you are taking from the word of God and adding to the word of God, if you are modifying the word of God, modulating the word of God, mutilating the word of God, and changing the word of God, and saying this one, I accept this one. I don't accept that one. This one is difficult. This one is easy. This one is practicable. This one, you cannot follow it now in the modern time. And then you're adding your own idea, your own opinion, and God finds you a liar. If you die in the condition of that liar, where do you go? Hellfire. You know, there are people, uh, people don't understand what we call friendship. They don't understand friendship. And they say, so and so is my friend. And, uh, you know, he, uh, you look at his age. He couldn't, uh, you know, get married in the proper way. And so he's gone to do this. And then he calls you privately. He says, my friend, I know, I know this is wrong. I know this is not all right. But look at my age. You know, if, if I were your biological brother, if I were your, you know, your relative, and you see me in this condition, Will you not sympathize with me? And the church is just saying, you're not my unbeliever. You're not my unbeliever. I go to this one, they say no. I go to that one, they say no. I go to that one, they say no. And now I find somebody from my village. And I find somebody who has agreed with me. And I want to marry that. And the church is bringing Bible, Bible, Bible. All the time. This one, I will do this one. Are you my friend or you are not my friend? I need support. I need help. I need the people that will go along with me. If you are my friend then you will help me now. I said, okay, he's my friend. Well, you help a liar, you somebody who had added to the word of God, who is changing the word of God. If he dies and go to, uh, goes to hell, your hand is there. Your mouth is there. Your money is there. Your support is there. And if you send them to hell, then God will take you to heaven. Tell me now. No. We must take our time. We must pray with them. We must wrestle with them. Agonize with them and say, this is the way. What key in there in? There are people that do not want us to preach the watch of God. And it's like, uh, you know, why are we emphasizing this and this all the time? I pray that God will give you the heart to obey the word of God in Jesus' name. Look at Isaiah chapter 30. Isaiah chapter 30. I'm reading here from verse 9 and verse 10. It says that this is the rebellious people, nine children, and children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, which say to the preachers, which say to the prophets, which say to the evangelists, to teach out the word of God, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, but speak unto us, tell me, smooth things, prophesy deceit. 
There are people that want something smooth. This one is, you know, it's very tough. It's going to take prayer. That's why she said we should pray. This one is going to take self denial. That's why it says deny yourself. This one is uh, going to take the grace of God. That's why I said my grace is sufficient for you. And by the grace of God, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. He will strengthen us. Are you still there? I said he will strengthen us. And then he tells us in verse 20 of that same Isaiah chapter 30 verse 20. And do the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction. Yet shall he not, shall not thy teachers be removed far into a corner anymore. But thine eyes shall see thy teachers. And then ear shall hear a word behind this saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When ye turn to the right hand, and when ye turn to the left, will obey the word of God in Jesus' name. Number three is our acknowledgement and perseverance in the God giving message. Our acknowledgement and perseverance in the God giving message. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 5. In Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5, hear what the word of the Lord is saying. It's saying, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. That's what it takes. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. If you're trusting the Lord partially, if you're trusting the Lord only for healing, only for deliverance, only for miracles, and not in every area, not in marriage, that's not right. But it says you trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes, fear the Lord, and depart from evil. Amen. Amen. You depart from the unequal yoke. I said you depart from the unequal yoke. Amen. You know, you say, but you know, we we promised each other, we made covenant together, we caught ourselves, and then we put the blood somewhere, drank something and all that. That's an equal yoke. That's occultism. You're going to break that and destroy that. Are you going to say, now I come to the Lord? I did that because my flesh was pulling me. I did that because my flesh was troubling me. I'm not going to go back to God and cancel that a kind of unequal yoke. You will not continue in that in Jesus' name. We're looking at 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 13. 1 Kings chapter 22. And here we're reading from verse 13. And verse 14, 1 Kings chapter 22, verse 13. And the messenger that was gone eh, to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy words, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. You know, they're telling us, uh, do you know, sir, that uh, that denomination used to preach what we're preaching about, they have modified it because they want to become people friendly. They, they understand that, you know, this generation in which we're living now, this is what they want. And if they're going to get the people to believe them or to accept them or to come to their church, their ministry, they have to dance to their tune. Well, we're dancing to the tune of heaven here. And we're dancing to the tune of the heavenly of the heavenly God here. We're not dancing to the tune of the world. They came to him and they said, All the people are saying the same thing. Why don't you say the same thing? Look at verse 14. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, is your God still alive? As your God changed, as the word of God changed, as Micaiah said, as the Lord liveth, what the Lord says unto me, tell me. That will I speak. What the Lord says unto me. And he has said everything in the word of God. And we're going to say that same thing in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 20. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. To the law and to the testimony. That's referring to the word of God. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there's no light in them. All those who are preaching, they preach over the radio, they preach over the television, they preach over the internet, they preach over the YouTube, they preach everywhere. If they speak not according to this word, 
they may be men, they may be women, they may say they have this that ministry, an angel appeared to them, they saw a vision or whatever it is. If they speak not according to this word, it is because, it is because, tell me, it is because there's no truth in them. You don't want to follow that. In Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 1, we're reading from verse 7. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 7. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go to all that I shall send thee. And whatsoever, whatsoever, whatsoever I command thee, thou shalt speak. Whatsoever the Lord has commanded, that's what you will speak in Jesus' name. We're looking at uh, Ezekiel chapter 3 verse 11. Ezekiel chapter 3, reading from verse 11, and go and get thee to them of the captivity and unto the children of thy people and speak unto them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, whether they will hear or they will reject. And there are people that are looking at the faces of the people before they preach the word of God. And if uh, these preachers see that the people are not accepting, then they turn around and begin to preach uh, something that is modified and watered down. I pray you will not be like that. I said you will not be like that. And our preachers will not be like that in Jesus' name. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, we're looking at verse 22. Acts of the Apostles chapter 3, verse 22, for Moses truly really said of the, unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me, and him shall ye hear in all things. It's talking about Jesus. Him shall ye hear in all things, and whatsoever he shall say unto you, is telling us that you know Christ was to come. He had not come at that time. And Moses said to the people, a prophet is coming with a capital P. And him will you hear because the Lord will put his word in his mouth. In verse 23, and it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Uh, Acts of the Apostles chapter 4 verse 19. In verse 19, it says, For Peter and John answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, more than unto God, judge ye. Verse 20, But we cannot but speak. We're going to speak. I said we're going to speak, but we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. We're looking at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. And we're looking at verse 4. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Marriage is honorable in all. The Lord has ordained that for everyone. And it says marriage, the right marriage, one man, one wife, until death, a do us part. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed on the file. But the all mongers and the adulterers tell me, God will judge. God will, this New Testament, adulterers, God will judge. Fornicators, God will judge. That's why it tells us in First Peter chapter three. First Peter chapter three. It's not telling us about now you are you are married. It says likewise she wives be in subjection to your own husbands. It's saying that you know all the quarrelling and the fighting and the disagreement and the commotion and the conflict we find in the world concerning their marriage. And uh, you know, you say I've read literature, I've read magazine, I've read this and that. This is how the women, this is how the you know the feminine kind of a movement, this is how they act to their husband. It says you are not like that. You're not taking your standard, you're not taking your principle from the magazines of the world you are reading, you're not taking your principle, your practice from all those things you see in the world. Likewise, she wise be in subjection to your own husband, that if any obey not the world. They also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. It's saying that if any man does not obey the word you have married before you became a believer, and you are now a believer, the man is not a believer. 
and is not obeying the watch of God. He doesn't send you to the divorce court. He doesn't say, okay, go leave him alone. Uh, he is an unbeliever. He's a heathen. He's an infidel. He says, you will live such a life, the life of grace, the life of righteousness, and the life of holiness, that your life will win the man unto the Lord. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, was adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of a plate in the air, of wearing of gold, or putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible. Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which in the sight of God is of great price let the husband see your humility and your meekness and let him see your character and let him see your subjection your submissiveness to the watch of God for after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection to their own husbands not obeying, uh, you know, another man, the boss in the office, more than you obey your husband. Not obeying the pastor in the church, more than you obey your husband. Not running to the overseer, the overseer, the one ruling the house, governing the house. Not running to the overseer every time, but being subjected to your own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughter she had, as long as she uh, do well and not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, ye husbands, ye husbands, ye men, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, and that your prayers be not hindered. I pray that as the Lord has given us his word, we'll be obedient to the word in Jesus' name. Well, you say, I'm not married yet. What uh, does the Lord have for me? Look at verse 8, finally. Be, all ye, be ye all of one mind. You are not married yet, or you are married. Whoever you are, you are young, you are old. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one on another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful and be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, nor railing for railing, both in the family and in our community, everywhere. Railing for railing, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called that this should inherit a blessing for ye that will love life this for everybody now and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no girl no lie no deception let him eschew let him shun evil and do good and let him seek peace and, and seal it for the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. I pray we will not do evil. And in this area of marriage, we will not go by, we will not go to the things of the world that we have left. We will stay with the Lord. And the word of God, which abides forever, will be a blessing to you, a blessing to me, a blessing to every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's remember in Matthew chapter 24. Let's remember Matthew chapter 24 and verse 35. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. He's our Savior. Is he your Savior? Is our Lord? Is he your Lord? He says everything he has spoken concerning marriage, concerning the family, and concerning every subject, they abide forever. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And I pray in your own heart, this one will not pass away. In your family, this word will not pass away. And in your place of work, this word will not pass away. You take the word with you everywhere you go. And you stand. And then you are distinct and different from the people of the world. And they know that the man there is a talking Bible. is a living Bible. If you want to understand the Bible, look at his life. Look at her life. Because the word of God abides in his life. And the word has not passed away in his life. I pray the Lord will make your life a replica of the Bible. So that the word of God, the light of the gospel, will be reproduced in your life every time, everywhere, in the family, in marriage, in everything, in Jesus' name. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I thank you for your word. Your word abides forever. And I'm going to stand by that word. And you're going to have victory over the gentle abominations and aberrations. 
over all that the Gentiles are doing, not according to the will of God. You come back to the world. If you have sinned, you repent. If you have gone into adultery, fornication, you repent. If you have gone into, you know, having concubines, concubines, you are not married, but you are living together, you repent. If you are married and you have driven away your wife, you repent. You call her back. And if uh, that first man is still there, that first husband is still there, that first wife is still there, you will do according to the word of the Lord. You are preparing yourself for heaven. You say, Lord, I know your word abides forever, and I want to abide in that word forever. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Having victory over the gentle abominations.